fight or flight response fails to protect us, it increases our chance of becoming traumatized. And then we cannot self-regulate. One of the body's most basic responses for survival has failed, leaving us with no option but to shut down or play dead. The more that our fight or flight response fails to keep us safe, for example, after repeated or reoccurring traumas, the less effective it is. The fight or flight mechanism becomes truncated in the brain rather than being strengthened and reaffirmed after successful use and deployment. The brain begins to learn that fight or flight, one of the body's most basic ways to keep you alive, is failing and doesn't work. This is why children and adults experiencing reoccurring trauma, especially, you can see this in situations like domestic abuse, the brain has learned that fight or flight is not effective and therefore will immediately revert to its most basic and final survival mechanism to play dead and surrender. So we go into the freeze state or we fawn. And this is actually extremely humiliating and painful and traumatizing so of course you will then dissociate this means we dissociate seeing your caregiver or in some cases your parent as a threat to your survival goes against every evolutionary instinct that is instilled in a child's brain. As children, our natural survival instincts mean that we rely on our caregivers to keep us safe in order to survive. There is no neurological adaption in the brain to see anything otherwise. This is how we've learnt to survive. This is how our species has come so far. As a kid, I used to be extremely scared of my dad because he could lose his temper any moment, from one moment to the next. Boom! Just like that. It was so unpredictable. You wouldn't see it coming. I was so scared all the time. Only so much later, when I was a little bit older, I was no longer that. But then, on the other hand, I also just had a lot of self-doubt because when my dad stopped using physical violence because I obviously grew up he still kept criticizing me at every opportunity he got don't walk like that don't sit like that stand up straight blah blah all of that or um dress like a woman that's not how a woman sits that's not like a normal person behaves all of that it was always directed on me as a person and doing it wrong socially whatever i did because even me reading so much as i did that was wrong too so even when the physical abuse stopped there was still verbal abuse words can cause so much pain if you live in a house with a person who is verbally abusive, it will crush you. Therefore, the child has to internalize their trauma. 
as very young children, they're unable to see these caregivers as bad because it goes against everything their brain says, I need to survive and this is how we have to do it. So if they can't see the person who's hurting them as bad, they have to turn that inwards. Something's wrong with me. They're right, I'm wrong. I'm the bad person. I'm broken. I don't deserve to be loved. If you are autistic, this will be true even more so. You think you are bad. You are doing it wrong. Because obviously others don't have issues. They can do it. Why can't I? You feel like an idiot. It's humiliating. And of course, your self-confidence will suffer a lot. You struggle and struggle. You feel stressed. You feel anxious. Socializing is hard. It doesn't come natural. And you are asking yourself, what is wrong with me? Why can't I do it? Why can't I be normal? like everybody else. And this is such a struggle inside. You try to push yourself, but it doesn't work. And then if you have additional pressure, also from your parents, your teachers, your peers. It's just traumatic. And you think you are a failure. You can do nothing right. So the result of that, you feel so depressed and you just go into a shutdown. For a parent, it would be very important to not criticize, but encourage their kid who is different otherwise a kid will grow up thinking this so I used to be really shy And it complicated things. It made it so hard to interact with people. And only about, mm, let's say, two or three years ago, I really had to learn not to be shy anymore because of that job I do for that it was actually a good thing it forced me to really um, see people as humans as equals. I used to see people as better or high up. There is always a 
inequality in how I looked at people and how I interacted with them. So I would say perhaps 90% of my initial shyness is gone. So that's really helping to interact or mask my way through life more or less. However, the absence of shyness does not mean I am now a completely happy camper and love to interact with people. That's completely wrong. I can put up a show, okay? I can pretend to be social, but it never comes naturally, never. It's always an effort. And I really don't like to do it. I don't like when somebody comes in my direction when I am walking somewhere. I have at times even crossed the street to the other side where there was nobody. I don't like to empty my letterbox, go outside. I prefer to stay in my flat most of the time. And uh, only when I absolutely have to get out of the house to buy food and stuff, then reluctantly I leave the house. And there is so much more. Like interacting with people, it's sometimes just so boring. And my brain just turns off. And I disappear in my own head, thinking about stuff I like. So I completely tune out and I stop listening. Sometimes that just really happens spontaneously. And I don't talk much. When you get to know me, you will discover I'm really not a talker. I just don't talk much. In a group, I just completely fall silent. And so many people have told me, Oh, you are so silent. You don't talk much. Or they prefer to interact with somebody else. And then they say, at least they can talk. So, another failure, right? But, really about the silence, that's not like shyness. It's just not possible to talk more. And also, if I talk too much, I start to feel exhausted. It's draining. And social interaction, that's so draining. 
I'm not an extrovert who really feels alive the more people are around. For me, it's the complete opposite. The more people, the more drained. And at some point, if there is so much noise, so many people, my brain just stops working. I have a brain fog. I get so tired. And then talking is even harder. It feels like I have a potato in my mouth. I can hardly get the words out. And I also don't know what to say. Suddenly there are no words left. So I function at my best when I am by myself and when I can interact online, write and use this way of communication. That's way better. Also, if somebody asks me a question, I am very often just speechless. I don't know what to say. I am caught off guard. Surprised. And questions often interrupt my train of thought. And then it is so hard for me because I lost my train of thought and then suddenly I am supposed to think where that person is coming from, how to understand that question and why does that person want to know this. So if I get questions asked in advance, if I can prepare for them, think about them, that works a bit better. But spontaneous questions, mm. I don't like them so much. And it also feels intrusive. I feel irritated by it also. Yeah, well, it is always a different thing when I can interact online, then questions don't seem so intrusive. That's really different. It's indirect. And you have no facial interaction, you just have the screen, you see it in writing, and it's way less intrusive. Although sometimes, well, on Facebook there are people they just want to know right away where do you live, what do you do, blah blah. And those questions I don't answer because I don't know the person and that's way too early to exchange such information, obviously. Verbal communication, it doesn't come natural. And I had to train myself even to talk to a screen like that. That used to be insanely difficult and I also was nervous at the beginning. But now I am a little bit used to it and it's more fluent. So it is actually a good training to do those videos.